Uh, I'm very, very pleased to be giving this uh, lecture in honor uh, uh, of Tadeusz Kowalik uh, and connecting it with my work on finance and the work of Rosa Luxemburg. The, uh, the usual connection that is made amongst Marxists is that uh, after Marx died, Hilferding wrote about, wrote about finance capital and then uh, gradually the, uh, the, the, the trail of references to finance peter out and we move into a very different kind of Marxism in the middle of the 20th century. In fact, uh, this is not the case. It, another path was started through the work of Rosa Luxemburg. And I, uh, it, and it was, it was a, it's a very important path and very relevant for our understanding of contemporary problems of political economy. Uh, in particular because the contemporary problems of political economy are clothed in the garments and the arguments of finance. And the, it's necessary for uh, an understanding uh, if one is going to present a critique of political economy as I believe radical economists should do, it's necessary to understand those financial issues. Tadeusz Kowalik was important in all of this, uh, and I will refer later on in the lecture to his um, book on Rosa Luxemburg, which sadly was only ever translated, it, it was published in Polish, by a very uh, obscure publisher. At the time, the authorities didn't want to, want it to be more widely read. Uh, it was translated into Italian, and it was translated into Spanish, as far as I know, but there was never a German or an English translation, never the, the German or English translation, that I think would have uh, um, made people understand what an important figure uh, he was for political economy and in particular for uh, placing Rosa Luxemburg and the work of Rosa Luxemburg at the heart of the political economy of the 20th century. So I will let me proceed. I have my, uh, my slides are being shown up on there. But as I look around the table, I see that the necks that are in that part of the room are much younger than the necks that are around on this, in this part of the room. So I'm assuming that the necks there will find it easier to twist around uh, than the necks here. I, uh, I'll start off, of course, where uh, one needs to start, which is Marx and the role of interest-bearing capital, because that's the prelude. You know, it's necessary to understand this before one can move to uh, finance capital in Hilferding and, Lu and Luxembourg, and then move on to the realisation problem in Rosa Luxembourg. Then the key area where finance comes in in, in Rosa Luxemburg's work, and this is uh, in her chapter on, on international loans and their connection with imperialism. And that has in it a theory of financial crisis. I'll, I'll, I'll mention this. I'll uh, mention uh, briefly also uh, another important figure who is probably known to the economists around here, Hyman Minsky, because there are connections there. And finally, uh, make, 
uh, uh, make my conclusion around the issue of how external markets are financed to realise companies' profits, because I think this goes to the... It's this point that comes from the work of Rosa Luxemburg, which is absolutely central to the work of... Um, uh, to understanding and criticising uh, the political economy of our time. We see the introduction, uh, uh, Marx and interest-bearing capital. I'll read out the bit that's on the ceiling. So that, uh, first of all, uh, the analysis of finance is, in, in Marx, is of course sketchy, but you can put this all together and it makes a clear and consistent uh, picture. Uh, mercantile capitalism uh, requires credit to finance cargoes and transport. This is the, the sort of circulating capital. The key issue there, as Marx point out, points out, becomes usury, the rate of interest that merchants have to pay to, um, uh, to those who lend them money, which, you know, it, it, and this gives rise to the, all these notions of interest is, uh, is dead money, it's a, it's, it's a burden on a capitalist enterprise. With um, industrial capitalism, uh, you know, another problem emerges, which is that industrial capitalism requires much more capital for much longer periods of time. Um, this was, uh, this is put, put forward by the great uh, German-American uh, Marxist Karl Niebel in a, bo uh, a book that he published after the Second World War uh, where, he, where he points out the desperate shortage of finance that the early capitalists have. And um, uh, Marx recognised this. Uh, but this is capital not for, for cargoes and for transport, but for buying machinery and equipment, which is going to last for a long time, and in which is going to enter much longer production cycles, has much longer production cycles before the money is returned. Uh, you know, a, a car traditionally a cargo going from Britain to India took three months, and hence short-term finances uh, traditionally. Uh, uh, lasts for, for up to three months. This is the, the standard amount for trade bills and so on. Uh, for uh, for production, much more capital is needed for a much longer uh, production cycle. And this is what, where in Marx you have an emergence of interest-bearing capital uh, it's, it's a new type of capital because it's capital which is tied up in, uh, in production for a very long period of time. And this gives rise to the first, probably the most important financial innovation in, uh, under capitalism, which is markets in long-term debt. The stocks and shares which give um, uh, which allow uh, capitalists to raise money for the period of the production cycle of equipment that will last for years. Uh, the uh, and these um, these new markets in debt capital were set up in the the, the major industrial countries. Uh, 1873 is significant for being the, 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 group, the Vienna stock market crisis, which brought down the stock markets, uh, uh, a number of other stock markets in Central Europe. And the, uh, it, the, 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 those stock markets never really recovered from that. You can read about this in the work of Charles Kindleberger. Uh, they... Uh, this is what precipitates the emergence of 
uh, bank-based long-term lending. Uh, so that uh, this is uh, what we, we nowadays refer to as the finance capital as, um, uh, as we find it in, in Hilferding and as it's criticised in Hilferding as being purely something that happens in, uh, in countries that use uh, banks uh, where, where the banks are the capital market form the capital market and not uh, the, a stock market. Now the important thing about this is that finance capital uh, in the interpretation of Hilferding only marks is not the intermediation between savers and borrowers, which is what you find in, uh, in mainstream economic uh, theory, um, uh, neoclassical economics, if you like, uh, but it's subsidiary to industrial capital. In Marx's terminology, it's subordinate to industrial capital. It is uh, industrial capital drives it. In Hilferding, it then appears as the driver of capital accumulation. And this was an idea which originally comes from Saint-Simon, curiously, the, the, the French utopian uh, socialist. Uh, and then uh, it, in Hilferding, it organises markets and organises the monopolies that form the cartels that will, in Hilferding's view, eventually stabilise uh, capitalism. In Rosa Luxemburg, it appears uh, rather differently. Uh, in a, there, there is a realisation problem. Surplus cannot uh, be used by the capitalist earning it unless he gets it in the form of money. And it's the conversion of economic surplus into money that is the essence of the realisation problem. Who is going to buy the surplus goods um, that will um, uh, that constitute the capitalist profit or the surplus of capitalists? And this is the, uh, the fundamental problem for, uh, for in Rosa Luxemburg. And the Kalecki identified uh, the crucial nature of this, that the problem is crucial. Rosa Luxemburg's solution is not necessarily f uh, fully correct. And Kalecki said in his essays published in 1939 uh, that Rosa Luxemburg's theory cannot be accepted as a whole but the necessity of covering the gap of saving by home investment. Uh, in other words, uh, money, uh, 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 goods that are produced, that are not sold uh, by home investment or exports was outlined by her perhaps more clearly than anywhere else before the publication of Mr. Keynes's general theory. So probably unique, uh, no actually it's not unique because Sweezy also, Sweezy and Joe Robinson used to make this connection between uh, Rosa Luxemburg and uh, Keynes, but it's uh, Kalinsky I think who, uh, who first put this forward. This gap of saving that he refers to appears as a problem of realising surplus. In other words, of selling output that is surplus to workers' income and wages. And this is why uh, Rosa Luxemburg is, becomes uh, considered, uh, comes to be considered as an under-consumptionist. Paul Sweezy refers to her as uh, an under-consumptionist in his book on the theory of capitalist development uh, many other 
Oscar Langer refers to her as, uh, uh, as an underconsumptionist if we come much uh, nearer our time. Uh, Meghna Desai, uh, in his article on underconsumptionism, uh, refers to, uh, 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 includes her as underconsumptionist. However, this is at a time when uh, underconsumptionism is widely believed to be the fundamental problem of capitalism, the problem that uh, wages are too low uh, and therefore because of this capitalists cannot realise uh, the surplus. There is a contradiction in this of course because, which I'll, which I'll come on to, uh, but it comes, uh, it comes around at a time when um, the, it was widely viewed that the uh, Marxian economic theory was essentially an underconsumptionist one, that, the, that uh, the long-term crises or succession of crises arise because of the problem of wages being too low. Uh, and this... Uh, really, I, you know, I guess continues, um, continued right through until the 50s uh, and the 60s. Um, in Sweezy, in his book, suggested that this realisation problem was a, 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 a problem of eventual capitalist breakdown. That because uh, wages could not rise sufficiently under capitalism. Eventually, capitalism um, will uh, 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 all break down. Uh, the, and this is linked very often to theories of the falling rate of profit. The extreme uh, example of this was the theory of the German uh, Polish. Uh, Marxist Henrik Grossman, who actually specified a particular period of time when capitalism would finally uh, 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 would enter its terminal crisis of not being able to realise profit. In actual fact, it's uh, the, this realisation problem is something different, and this the interpretation of this. Uh, 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 the realization problem was something not that that, that that culminates at the end of capitalism, but as a uh, regulator of the business cycle, uh, was first put forward by Tadeusz Kowalik in his book Rosa Luxemburg: Teoria Akkumulacji i Imperialismu. Uh, the Rosa Luxemburg: The Theory of accumulation and imperialism, the book that I referred to uh, at, at the very beginning uh, of this lecture. Uh, Tadeusz Kowalik had been asked uh, when he, maybe I should say something about his background, he came from a very poor family, uh, poor home in Eastern Poland, he joined the Communist Party uh, immediately after the war, he did his, his first degree in law and then uh, proceeded to doing a doctorate with, uh, uh, with, with Oscar Langer uh, at Warsaw University. Oscar Langer was at that time lecturing uh, at the party school uh, of social sciences, the high school of social sciences. Uh, he, uh, he had a course in uh, political economy, and when uh, uh, when uh, uh, Langer Langer did this through the 1950s for, for various personal reasons, Langer was very kept his head down very much in the early 50s. In 1956, Langer becomes a very important figure in the state, takes on state responsibilities, and Tadeusz Kowalik took over from him the course in, um, in, in, in political economy. And there are 
the suggestions in this book, which I recently read, uh, where he, he refers to, to these lectures. I think that the book is actually his, uh, his course on, uh, on political economy. And th I think this is why he, in effect, reconstructs uh, political economy around the topic of Rosa Luxemburg. Uh, Rosa Luxemburg uh, being the person that he, he chose to write uh, his postdoctoral thesis on, the, the Habilitatia. Uh, the, the story that he told me was that he decided to write this, his postdoctoral thesis on Rosa Luxemburg and he went to Oscar Langer and said, I want to write a, a, my postdoctoral thesis with you. Langer was very pleased because Tadeusz Kowalik was his most brilliant student. And he said, he asked him what he wanted to write the subject on. And uh, Tadeusz said to him, I want to write it on Rosa Luxemburg. Now, Langer had had his history with the Communist Party. He had, he, Langer had started off as being a critic of, uh, of the Communist Party in the pre-war years, had then made various compromises uh, to become, uh, and had, a, had joined the Polish Socialist Party, personal Polish Socialist Party, which was incorporated in the, uh, in the Polish Communist Party. What was, uh, so, Langer always had an ambiguous relationship with the, with the Polish Communist Party. Uh, more importantly, the Polish Communist Party in the pre-war years had been dissolved by the Comintern in 1938 uh, with accusations of uh, Luxembourgism and Trotskyism. And these were, uh, so that they were in the post-war period they were very delicate issues to raise. Um, uh, actually, the, the, uh, 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 the, the leadership of the Polish Communist Party, the pre-war Polish Communist Party, after the, it was dissolved, they were told to go to Moscow and all of them put on trial uh, and executed. So, a very sensitive subject. Uh, and this is why when Langer heard uh, Tadeusz Kowalik said he wanted to write his dissertation on Luxembourg. He thought for a while and then he said to him, uh, yes, do that subject. It's an interesting subject, but it will do you no good at all. <laughs> and indeed, it, you know, it didn't do Tadeusz much good uh, in his career, but I actually think that this book uh, is really establishes him as one of the uh, leading Marxist writers uh, in the 20th century. Uh, so, uh, what Kadot Kovalik does is he argues that the, uh, the realization problem is, um, or, or the, way, the, the, the extent of the realization of profit determines how capitalism moves from year to year. So, it's a short term. A problem uh, of how capitalism reproduces itself in the short term and not just a theory of crisis. Uh, in Marx and Kalecki you can find the part of the solution to, the, to this problem. Uh, Marx and Kalecki both pointing out that uh, the realization problem uh, is solved not by uh, workers spending more money because they can't spend any more than they earn. And in uh, this, this, this was the fallacy of underconsumptionism that the, uh, it presumed that somehow the workers spending more than they had. Uh, that then they got as wages would solve the, the realization problem. And of course, it doesn't. What solves the realization problem is capitalist consumption and investment. 
And uh, Rosa, what was interesting about Luxembourg's analysis is that she points out, pointed out that external trade uh, the, uh, constitutes another external market, a way in which surplus can be realised, although uh, she argued this was gross exports, it's, it's actually it's net exports that assist in realisation. Um, there is also a domestic external market, you can call it an external market because it's external to capitalist production, and that's in the form of government expenditure, uh, Luxembourg's militarism, or Keynes's fiscal policy, or, the, uh, uh, or indeed the, the, the fiscal policy is found in Kaletsky. And uh, one can add to this, this is probably a, a mid to later 20th century suggestion, there's also a domestic external market of middle class expenditure. Uh, this is what you find in Steindl's Maturity and Stagnation in American Capitalism, uh, uh, de actually derived from the work of Kalinsky and uh, Sweezy in Monopoly Capital, where he talks about various forms of you know, advertising waste. Well, this is a kind of the middle class as, a, uh, as a, an external market to assist with realising the surplus. Both Hilferdig and Luxembourg saw the export of capital as a way of realising this surplus. Um, and for, for Hilferding, capital export is benign and stabilising. Uh, it, it assists in stabilising uh, capital. And for Luxembourg saw a darker side to this, and that is that it may, may, may assist in stabilising capital accumulation in the capitalist countries, but in the developing countries, it actually destabilizes uh, their, their economies, and particularly the traditional economy of the developing uh, country. But here, I, you know, I have to point, I have to emphasize, this is finance, international loans are not a way in which uh, borrowers and savers come together to borrow money and you know this kind of thing. It's explicitly an arm of industrial capital with the loans being there to generate the market or create the market for capital exports. So in her theory of financial crisis you have international loans being undertaken to finance the export of capital goods to non-capitalist countries, uh, helping to realise profits in the, in, in the capitalist countries. When the indebted enterprises in the non-capitalist countries cannot service the debt anymore, then the crisis breaks out. Uh, Luxembourg has no illusions, uh, uh, none of these kind of neoclassical or even Keynesian illusions that you have a, a capitalist who calculates, foresees what will be the expected return and then compares that with the rate of interest that will be paid on the loan or anything else like this. Uh, but, uh, why? Because it's not necessarily the capitalist in the developing country who is driving this process. It's the capital who it's the capitalist who's exporting the equipment who is driving the process. Uh, and needless to say will exaggerate the, the product, uh, productivity of the equipment. Okay, the uh, in uh, the way she describes it in this chapter it's it, it's largely descriptive. Uh, the, the, the government of the non-capitalist country and developing country takes over responsibility uh, for the debt. Well, this is, this is again the, 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 the government being 
Um, the government in the, in the capitalist countries, of course, the executive committee of the bourgeoisie, in the developing countries, they are an annex to that, to that executive committee. In other words, they're under the control of the governments in the capitalist countries. So if a crisis breaks out, the government uh, of the non-capitalist country can't just repudiate the debt, but has to take over responsibility. Typically, debt service payments are secured on tax revenue. In the, 19, in the 1890s, the 1900s, the period about which Rosa Luxemburg was writing, there were what were called international debt commissioners uh, who went into the Ministry of Finance and just took uh, as much tax revenue as they could lay their hands on to service their debt. The equivalent today is, of course, the IMF in developing countries, uh, the, the Troika in Greece. The, uh, generally, the, uh, the, the presumption being that you, know, you have to extract as much uh, uh, tax revenue as possible uh, for um, the, the, the debt commissioners. Incidentally, I can add as a kind of uh, a, a, as a footnote to, to this: the in developing countries, most tax revenue is obtained from customs receipts, simply because you don't have people who are you don't have a sufficiently large uh, middle class, and all those people on uh, relatively high incomes uh, who one can tax or one can one can extract. A significant amount of tax from. So most taxes come in the form of uh, taxes on trade and uh, it, it, it used to be the case that uh, what, uh, what would happen is that the, the, the customs houses would be, uh, uh, would be given as security for international loans. Mexico did this uh, at, at one time. In other words, uh, then guaranteeing that whatever revenue was obtained from the customs would go to, to pay the debt. Uh, in the developing country, of course, the modern sector is controlled by foreign capital and cannot be taxed. Uh, uh, you know, they will simply evade the tax or they will resist it successfully or evade if they can't resist successfully. So effectively, the higher taxes fall on the traditional economy. And this is where, this is how the traditional economy goes into decline. Uh, the non-capitalist countries enter the capitalist mode of production, effectively through financial crisis. Let me say, uh, let me show how the link emerges between this kind of analysis and Minsky. Minsky uh, put forward uh, a financial instability hypothesis uh, in which he argued that the, um, uh, uh, the capitalist economy is prone to instability and that instability appears as financial crisis. His argument actually was rather different to that of um, Luxembourg. In Minsky, it's uh, the profits that are not sufficiently large to, uh, uh, to pay debt. Uh, Minsky overlooks uh, the essential other part, which you find in Rosa Luxemburg, it seems to me is essential for a proper Marxist understanding of finance, the extent to which uh, finance and the loans are a way of realising profit. Um, uh, Minsky is, uh, is very ambiguous on, on, on this part of the, of the process, but very, very clear that uh, once 
uh, once de uh, debt goes over a certain level uh, that can be managed within the existing gross uh, profits, then crisis breaks out. Uh, in both their analyses, greater indebtedness is secured on an unknown future income from buying and operating uh, new capital equipment uh, in the non-capitalist countries. Uh, uh, so, uh, the in the in the non in the capitalist countries, um, the uh, can, uh, uh, capitalists are already under a profit realization constraint. Uh, they they overcome this constraint by uh, the export of capital, um, but the export of capital in the final analysis has to generate future revenue from somewhere. Uh, that somewhere who could be or might be even further uh, future capital export. In this sense, capitalism becomes. Uh, can become like uh, uh, a, a kind of Ponzi scheme, a pyramid banking scheme, the necessity to continue exporting capital uh, uh, to realise profit. Because if you don't do this, then your, uh, 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 the, the crisis will break out, and crisis will break out in the home country as well, in the capitalist country as well. Uh, so, in this sense, Luxembourg looks forward to that, uh, to the point where it's no longer possible uh, to export capital, and that's the point at which she, she believes that capitalist, the capitalist world, the whole world will be capitalist, and uh, the, the possibilities of further capital accumulation will be severely constrained. In the meantime, crises occur due to excessive indebtedness. Luxembourg goes beyond Minsky because in her analysis uh, the bank finance is not under the control of the borrowers but of the producers of capital equipment whose sale uh, is, realized, it is required to, to, to realise profits. Uh, the second point at which Luxembourg goes beyond Minsky and is a contemporary point is that finance controls governments and can make them extract rents from indebted uh, from the indebted economy, so that it is not uh, uh, the, the, the government in effect uh, is uh, you know burdens the rest of the economy. Uh, you know, burdens it with a form of austerity, I suppose we would call nowadays, call it nowadays. And finally, that risk is socialised to secure profit from productive activity. Luxembourg has absolutely no doubt about it that uh, the uh, purpose of uh, you know, the capitalist government in the final analysis will always be there to ensure that payment is made on financial obligations uh, in contrast to the uh, uh, Minsky who, uh, who by then, I think, I guess by the 1970s, by the 1980s had uh, you come to much more Keynesian uh, uh, Conclusions that in a democratic society, the state is somehow neutral in all of this. Let me uh, come to my conclusion. Uh, financing, the, the, my conclusion is about financing uh, external markets to realise capital profits. I think that is the essential theory of uh, uh, finance that you find in Luxembourg. 
uh, Luxembourg retains the Marxian notion that interest is derived from surplus in production. Uh, absolutely clear about this, that the, uh, uh, it's necessary for a capitalist process, a production process to occur for a surplus to be generated and then in interest um, redistributes that. Uh, now this is important because it puts um, Luxembourg together with Minsky, so not, not Minsky, together with Marx and together with Keynes with a particular view on the way in which the financial markets occur. If the only surplus possible that's possible uh, is derived from uh, production, then you can have what Keynes calls uh, the, the euthanasia of the rentier. If you reduce the rate of interest to zero, uh, you force what Marx called the money capitalists, in other words, the people who are in the financial markets engaged in uh, um, turning over capital in the financial markets, you force them into industrial production. And this was Keynes's solution for the problem of underinvestment in capitalism. You reduce the rate of interest down to zero and the uh, capitalists uh, uh, will then uh, you know, start buying machinery and equipment as a way, because they'll be able to generate more profit from that than from the financial markets. Curiously, Marx mentions exactly the same kind of uh, case in Volume 3 of Capital where he asks the question, and he, this is in, the, in his discussion where he, he wants to prove the point that, uh, the, that uh, interest is derived from surplus in production. He's, he, uh, Marx asks, asks the question, what would, um, what would happen if you drove the rate of interest down to zero? And then he says, why then? Obviously, the, uh, the money capitalists would, would not be able to generate any income from their capital, so what would they do? They'd enter into industrial production and, in this way, uh, become industrial ca uh, capitalists and move from being what Marx called money capitalists to functioning capitalists. Um, it's interesting to compare that kind of analysis that Keynes Marx analysis with what's happening today with quantitative easing in the developing countries where what's happening, the rate of interest is down to zero. Do we have an investment boom? No, we don't have an investment boom. The money is going to the emerging markets and causing all sorts of problems for countries like Brazil, uh, as you know, uh, and other um, Brazil, Mexico, and other emerging markets. So it's uh, uh, it, this is an interesting point at which I guess today's uh, uh, finance capital is moving beyond the point. The second, my second conclusion is that um, Rosa Luxemburg is not an underconsumptionist, despite uh, what, what has been argued. Uh, the, uh, it's, uh, the, this, has been, this is a mistaken conclusion uh, by Marxists who uh, spotted the fact, or identified the fact that Luxembourg was unable to think through the means by which profits are realised. Uh, in investment, capitalist consumption, external markets, and external markets of the trade balance and the government. And here is my the most important conclusion.
conclusion, and the conclusion on, uh, on finance, that Luxembourg saw more clearly than others before her, Marxists and non-Marxists, how capitalist finance provides the link to external markets, to those external markets, to those external markets uh, in the developing countries. Uh, she doesn't mention you know, how armaments are financed, but quite clearly this is yet another external market. She saw this more clearly than uh, Hilferding. And the other point about her is that she showed that capitalist finance provides purchasing power at the cost of indebtedness and crisis. And I think this is the, the what makes her analysis uh, uh, so relevant to our predicaments today, our predicaments in Europe, uh, but our global predicaments as well. Thank you very much. Thank you. And it was very interesting, and now we have a lot of theoretical questions, practical questions we can take into account when we um, uh, will have a discussion here in the next three days. Three days. Um, two and a half. Two and a half. Uh, precise. And we will have time to discuss some uh, uh, questions you uh, highlighted. Uh, but at first, it's necessary to make some remarks concerning our uh, session here. Uh, you have in your uh, maps here an agenda, yes? Schedule. Um, that's not the actual. The actual is relatively, relatively. The actual uh, was the version you uh, get by email in the last hour.